Brad, I think I fixed it, so come back. Um, Give me just one more minute, Wendy. Yep, I think we're good. Yep. What does Sorry. Sherry need to do to get this started, though? Oh, she's just going to have to hit play when the time comes. Okay. I just went to the menu. Sorry? Thank you very much. Do you want the thing playing on both? The DVD on both? It is DVD, right? For what? It's in the DVD player? Oh. So I, the display went out on the computer. I'm not sure why. Give me just one more. Like uh, while it was while it was down there, all of a sudden the display stopped. Oh. I don't know. Did Something must have come disconnected.
she's got to. So does she, she want to skip the video? No. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to get a presentation, but, right. but if it's not going to work, we need to move it. Right. You know, like, she has to have time. Just the display was working a second ago, so I'm assuming the cable came out. It's a blue, right? Will that play this? Yeah, I can try. <laughs> the thing is, I'm just not sure why the display is not coming out. No, it still says computer one. So you want to check the input buttons on the front? Maybe like we were doing in 2.30? It's coming on. Okay, we fixed it. Yeah, there it is. So now, now we should switch back to the computer. Yeah. No, 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 we got it. No, we were trying to fix the audio. I went to the switcher and went out. But it's back up. Yep, we're gonna move it back. Are we safe? Yeah. Yep. We're gonna have to. Are we safe to go? Yep. Is this working? Yeah. Wow. I never teach here with a microphone. Oh, I think I have some. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 18th uh, annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture. Uh, today we welcome Terry McGovern, Senior Program Officer at the Ford's Foundation, who's going to speak about what are the rights of women living with HIV. In a minute, Professor Martha Davis is going to introduce our speaker. First, however, I want to speak very briefly about the importance of this lecture series. I had the honor and privilege, and it really was one, of knowing Valerie Gordon, a 1993 graduate for whom this lecture series is named. While still in law school, Valerie exemplified what we prize in NUSL students. She was one of the students that at least this teacher will never forget. Wickedly smart, always engaged, filled with energy, able to express her own views strongly, and she had strong views, but always respectfully and always able to hear other sides and persuade people to her point of view, a truly gifted advocate and a student who became, although for too short a time, a friend. Valerie was a committed activist for civil and human rights. In 1993, along with her future husband and fellow student and friend and fellow human rights activist, Chris Lamar, who's with us today. She helped lead a student, a color coalition that tirelessly and effortlessly and effectively advocated for changes in the law school. Although I cannot say that we have lived up to all of Valerie's aspirations for us, I know that our own commitment to human rights and social justice is far stronger today because of Valerie's efforts in her time here. For example, today all of our students are now required to work on social justice on a social justice project, and that is a direct um, outgrowth of Valerie's advocacy skills. And of course, we now have the program on human rights in the global economy, which hosts this lecture and works in a wide variety of ways to further human rights. 
It's only fitting, therefore, that each year we dedicate this lecture on human rights to Valerie, and we welcome into our community her family, many of whom share her passion for social justice. Um, later, Boma Prega Julius will introduce some members of the family to us. We are honored by their presence with us today. It's my pleasure now to introduce my colleague, Professor Martha Davis, a human rights advocate herself and co-director of the Program on Human Rights in the Global Economy. Thank you, Wendy. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Terry McGovern. Um, as Wendy said, Terry is currently a pro senior program officer with the Ford Foundation, where she works on gender rights and equality, focusing on human rights-related HIV AIDS issues. Before joining the Ford Foundation in 2006, she was an assistant professor of clinical population and family health and social medical sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, and she also served as director of the Women's Health and Human Rights Advocacy Project at the school. So there's some ironies here, um, and I think Terry would be the first to appreciate them. Um, Terry works in a very fancy building on East 43rd Street, and um, as a Ford program officer, she's pulled into many high-level meetings where she has the opportunity to make a great difference on HIV and AIDS policy. But what sets Terry apart from those who get comfortable with power, I think, and what makes her so beloved in the activist community is her commitment to engagement with social movements and with individuals who are directly affected by the issues that she's addressing. Not only does she herself serve as a voice for marginalized constituencies, but she ensures that those constituencies have the power and the wherewithal to raise their own voices. I've known Terry for about 25 years, since we worked together briefly at the Hell's Kitchen office of the MFY Legal Services at 51st and 10th in New York City in the late 1980s. Doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, and the rest, of, the rest of us were doing our best, swimming in intake and trying to put out fires. Terry, however, was not satisfied by putting a finger in the dike. She discerned a pattern in the work that the rest of us had either overlooked or ignored. What she saw was, in short, that because of the male-based definition of HIV-related disability under Social Security regulations at the time, women were being routinely denied necessary benefits under Medicaid and Social Security. So in 1989, Terry left MFY Legal Services and founded HIV Law Project in New York City and served as the executive director for 10 years. She successfully litigated numerous cases there, including SP versus Sullivan, which was the case that forced the Social Security Administration to expand its disability criteria to encompass uh, women's um, uh, uh, symptoms and manifestations. Uh, at the time, she wasn't long out of law school. She was just in her um, at 30 years old, and yet she took on this massive class action against the government. A few years later, she brought TN versus FDA, which eliminated a 1977 Food and Drug Administration guideline that restricted the participation of women of childbearing potential in early phases of clinical trials. And that was one of the few ways that women could get access to these medications, yet they were being excluded from the trials. I had a chance to work with Terry on that issue and saw firsthand the vision and doggedness that she brought to addressing this problem. Later, as a member of the National Task Force on AIDS and Drug, AIDS Drug Development, Terry wrote the 2001 federal regulation authorizing the FDA to halt any clinical trial for a life-threatening disease that excludes women. But maybe most characteristic of Terry's approach is that while at the HIV Law Project, she also developed a client training program, which prepares HIV-positive women to have an impact in the policymaking arena. And throughout her work, she remains engaged in building connections between social movements and legal advocacy. Those who know Terry know that she's a sophisticated legal and strategic thinker, but not a, not a pretentious person, and an activist to the core. And as an activist, she's not afraid to be a thorn in the side of those who have power. I'll just close by saying that thinking about this introduction and thinking about the, the many years that I've known Terry brought to mind a favorite quote of mine from Che Guevara that I think captures something of Terry's approach to the issues and her unwavering commitment to her clients and to social movements. And that is, quote, the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. And Terry McGovern is, I believe, a true revolutionary. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. It's going to be very hard to live up to that introduction, but thank you so much. And uh, Martha and I have had uh, the chance to work together and collude on all kinds of um, you know, human rights activities through the years, so it's a pleasure to be here. I was so honored when I read about Valerie Gordon's life, um, someone who was clearly so very special and had such a great impact. 
Um, I want to thank Valerie's family, the Black Law Student Association, and the Dean and Faculty of Northeastern for having me here. Northeastern, which is so important in the human rights struggles domestically and internationally. Um, after a lot of thought, I decided to talk about the human rights of HIV-affected women today. Frankly, as you all know, there are so many human rights violations to choose from. But I thought that given the kind of current misogynistic climate that we're hearing about, um, this was the right topic. I'm going to talk about a whole lot of complex dynamics, a whole set of messy issues. I'm not going to do what I think the UN of often does, which is wrap it all up at the end with uh, solutions and a happy ending, which never actually come to pass. Instead, I'll succeed if you leave with some lingering concern about the disturbing dynamics driving the data and what you can do about it. Two weeks ago, we had a Johns Hopkins study tell us that the HIV infection rates of black women living in five U.S. cities was five times higher than previously thought, five times similar to rates in Kenya, Congo, or Tanzania. Last week, the NIH told us that African American women have two times the death rate due to AIDS than white women. African American women are 14% of the population, yet 66% of new infections. Young African American women in the South are the fastest growing population with heterosexually acquired HIV. In the US, HIV is the leading cause of death for black women ages 25 to 34. Only a couple of days after the announcement was made about these numbers, the underestimation of infection rates, I went to a White House briefing on HIV and gender violence. The good news is that the administration is trying to grapple with these set of issues. But at that meeting, a CDC researcher told us outright the paths to the link between HIV and sexual and physical violence are just woefully understudied. That is, we know there is a correlation between HIV, sexual and physical violence. Women with a history of violence have four times the risk of acquiring HIV. Of course, anyone who's ever worked with HIV positive women knows this, but in 2012, we just don't know much about the specifics. We can tell you all you might want to ever know about data how, depicting the devastating impact of HIV on black women and girls, but in the context of one of the biggest vulnerabilities for black women, paths have not been interrogated. How much is actual transmission of HIV due to violence? How much is caused by the violence-induced emotional and physical damage that leads to substance abuse? What is the impact of an inability to negotiate safe sex? having multiple partners, drug use, STDs, intergenerational sex, transactional sex. These are a set of harmful behaviors which leave girls and women vulnerable to HIV. I wish I were surprised, but I will argue that these data were entirely predictable given the historic failure to provide sexuality education and information, the early messages about who is at risk for HIV AIDS, and the combination of sexism and racism and homophobia infiltrating the response to this epidemic. I have three major themes to address today. The first is that activism and advocacy have driven all advancements in HIV and AIDS. Secondly, the powerlessness and discrimination experienced by affected groups relative to other groups and actors affected by the epidemic has allowed the numbers to play out as they have. What I mean is that we have serious epidemics among black men who have sex with men in the U.S. because the response for gay men did not adequately address affected black men who have sex with men. Prisoners, for example, because of the lack of rel the relative lack of power, have been co completely overlooked. Globally, sex workers, migrants, transgender people, men who have sex with men, and of course, women and girls, where structural inequality is consistently at play. Sexual and physical violence, lack of equality under the law, lack of e economic parity, and the refusal to promote and protect the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and girls have fed this epidemic. 
But these are larger human rights violations that women face. The HIV specifics are just clear symptoms of these unaddressed issues. Lastly, let me go back to my thesis that directly affected folks have driven all advancements. I want to argue that change is happening, and you can all be part of that change. Martha talked a bit about my experience at the HIV Law Project, and I want to talk a bit about that because I think it sets up the kind of harmful dynamics that have you know, lingered in this epidemic around women and girls. I have a video that they made from when I left the HIV Law Project, which is why there's a weird introduction of me in it, but I wanted to use it because you, I wanted you to meet some of the women who were the heroes at the beginning of the epidemic, most of whom are unfortunately long gone. Um, what Martha was talking about is back in the late 80s, actually, some women incarcerated at Bedford Hills began to write that women were getting AIDS and dying, but they weren't being diagnosed of it. They were saying AIDS looks different in women, but because women weren't studied and are voiceless, we are not just, we are not in the AIDS definition. ACT UP picked up on this and started to write about it, and because I didn't understand what was happening with my clients who were all dying, I actually went and stood at the back of ACT UP, heard them talking about this CDC definition, and actually tried to figure out a way to address it. Um, what you'll see in this clip is the construction of the class action lawsuit, but also, much more importantly, a demonstration that was held the day we filed the class action in 1990 outside of Health and Human Services, and it was the first and a demonstration of HIV positive women in the U.S. Um, again, the women you're going to see are the heroes of the early struggle. Okay. Of course, I can't see. Just start, right? Okay. Drug addicts were not important. Mm -hmm. Women's issues in the AIDS community is the lowest thing on the totem pole. I really observe women who died. I always think that without dignity because they just were left to die. The most horrible thing that I observed in prison was two security guards betting how long a woman had to live. And uh, you talk about being powerless and helpless. And I saw them put the money down, and she did die two days later. All of these, you know, bureaucrats and professionals couldn't deal with sexual issues, couldn't deal with IV drug use, weren't taught anything about it, didn't have any uh, basis for even asking the questions. So none of the information emerged. None of the questions were asked. The discomfort was palpable. And, and women were so much the brunt of that. They were so much the brunt of that in this epidemic. Oh, I lost so many people. Sometimes I don't even want to think about it. I got to the point that I don't even go to funerals. It's hard enough dealing with all of that. But then being told AIDS, again, to me it just meant death. And the worst thing that could possibly, I felt like I was being punished. So the one way to get at me was to hurt this baby. She's all I lived for. Recognizing HIV in women um, it was one of the hardest tasks of, of, of this decade. Now that I escape, sleep, walk away. People need to know who initiated the fight and went out there and volunteered to help people like myself because there weren't people lining up to do that, that's for sure. Okay, and you're supposed to laugh at this. Don't wanna know the result. We're here to say, why don't you stop the rhetoric and make sure that people get health care? Uh, we called the HIV Law Project, we called Tampa Government's office, 
there was going to be some action taken if you were a woman, especially if you were a woman and you had HIV. It was actually in 1989 I was at MFY Legal Services on 10th Avenue when I started to see all these women and low-income gay men who had AIDS, who were HIV positive, totally sick, couldn't get benefits, didn't technically have AIDS. I started then to take those cases, and but officially the HIV Law Project, where I got my first grant to start seeing just HIV clients, was at 35 Avenue A. Nothing was due to HIV. You know, later it became everything was due to HIV. But in those days, whatever was going on, well, it's not due to HIV, HIV doesn't cause this. You feel like your hands are tied, because you know what's going on, all right, but they, you're being told, well, you don't have AIDS, you know, and you're like, well, what's going on with my body then? I mean, why do I feel so terrible? I knew that T cells were a marker of uh, basically how your immune system was doing, and maybe in a in a healthy person you might have 14 to 1600 T cells and these women who were coming in had like six T cells, three T cells, I knew enough to know that they were very ill. The thing I remember most was how what horrible medical care people were getting and how stupid their doctors were. Lisa had looked through so many medical records and we were able to actually see this really clear pattern of you know pneumonias, tuberculosis, gynecological disease, very low T cell counts, and an absolute inability to qualify for Social Security disability. So, um, let me go back to the litigation trajectory of the first 10 years of the HIV Law Project because it illustrates some very grim patterns about women, mostly women of color. Um, I don't think, unfortunately, they're very different from global patterns. First, we had to sue over women being overlooked at the AIDS definition. That's what you've seen. Um, the AIDS diagnosis was the gateway to everything, housing benefits, disability, Medicaid. Then, as Martha said, we had to file a citizen petition against the FDA to, to actually get women into clinical trials. We kept being contacted by these women who, one in particular, who tried to get into a Johns Hopkins trial and they wanted to sterilize her. And her doctor and she called to say, I don't want to be sterilized, I'm very sick, I'm not even sexually active. Um, and of course we realized that this, there was kind of a prohibitive guideline saying, you know, women couldn't get into early phases just in case they got pregnant. Um, this was at a time when there were no drugs and people were desperate and ACT UP, mostly men in ACT UP, had actually pushed through an expedited drug approval process so that people could get drugs faster, but many women couldn't even get into the trials at all. Um, and by 1995, we went from this trajectory to suing because New York State had, mandatory, had, had instituted mandatory HIV testing of pregnant women. And this was before we even had any requirement that women in prenatal care be offered testing or counseled about risk. So we actually sued to stop the implementation of the program without an offer of voluntary testing to pregnant women. And then when they instituted the program, they started testing pregnant women through their babies, but then not telling them for three weeks if they were positive. So we had a number of women come in who had breastfed their babies after they'd been mandatorily tested, and only to learn then that they were HIV positive. So we went in and forced the state to actually spend the money to give rapid test results to the women who'd been tested. Um, we. Uh, this is, unfortunately, a cynical history. We went from ignoring the disease pattern in women and failing to address risk to blaming women and saying we need to mandatorily test women to save their children. What did they skip? They skipped the part about offering voluntary testing, about explaining risk and treatment options, that you need women's cooperation to save children. They skipped the part about educating youth about sexuality and sexual health. They skipped the part about scaling up family-centered services, prevention, and care that would work for women. They skipped the part of targeting effective prevention and care models for black women and girls. The non-cynical part of all of this are the women themselves here and around the world. 
the women who stood up and said, I am dying of AIDS, and I look just like you, and I did exactly what you do, or the women who came to the HIV Law Project and said, I will not be sterilized, the women you hear about throughout this lecture, the women who said, the government may not tell you this, but I am you, and I have HIV. I could spend this entire time talking about HIV Law Project. I won't except to say that we were unable to win individual cases without fixing larger policy problems, which is what led us to all this impact work. But you know, it wasn't the class action litigation, it wasn't just the demonstration, it was the actually investing in the clients and training women about what was causing this incredible discrimination, that there were actual policies that were responsible for the fact that they couldn't get Medicaid. Um, we had that substantive training program that Martha alluded to, and we named it after one of the women you saw on the screen, Katrina Haslip. Katrina I had heard about for years. She was a jailhouse lawyer for many, many women with HIV in the late 80s. I came to know her because we did so many cases together. She was one of the women who put these issues on the map. She got out of prison actually the day before that demonstration you saw in 1990. She fell ill and died in December of 92. She never had AIDS technically, so we couldn't get her a home care attendant when she was so weak to even stand. The women took turns caring for her. She died December 2nd. The CDC announced it was expanding the AIDS definition two weeks later, as did Social Security expand its criteria. The FDA lifted that guideline. We were able to have victories, but somehow it didn't seem like they were victories. Mandatory testing of pregnant women continues in New York State, but at least now their women are counseled and receive meds in time to prevent vertical transmission. But I want to pull back the lens now and talk about the global picture. There are 40, 34 million people with AIDS. Thanks to treatment activism, 47% of those who need it have access to drugs. This is a huge increase from 2003. The cost of meds, the ARVs, has decreased dramatically due to increased competition from generic drugs. But still, globally, 53% of adults lack access. And in children, it's even more horrifying. Only 23% of the children who need it are currently in treatment. In the U.S., 20% of folks don't know they are HIV positive. There are over 4,000 people on wait lists for drugs. This is happening at the precise moment when we've learned that we've had kind of a scientific breakthrough. That if you start ARV treatment at higher T cells, you can really stem transmission by at least 97%. There's at least one study that's shown that. Um, so the question is, how could this be? How could we have so many people not accessing treatment that could save so many lives? I want to break down some of the components of how. Many countries are not meeting their own commitments about HIV AIDS treatment. They're simply not. And internationally, the most relevant legislation is the World Trade Organization's Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, or the TRIPS Agreement. The impact of TRIPS was to increase the intellectual property protection and rights for World Trade Organization countries. This locked in higher drug prices. Due to lots of advocacy and activism, in 2001 there was a Doha declaration on TRIPS and public health where the World Trade Organization said these rules should not prevent countries from taking steps to protect public health and promote universal access to treatment. There were flexibilities outlined to meet public health objectives. Some countries have adopted these specifically compulsory licensing, but far too few have used these flexibilities due to enormous political and legal pressure. We also saw in 2000 the creation of the Global Fund, which you all hear about, thanks to the activist and Kofi Annan, which created an independent financing mechanism for donors and saved millions of lives. Unfortunately, the Global Fund has just suspended the next funding round due to lack of funds. Folks are working to try and figure out what this means, but it's anticipated that 22 countries will face significant treatment interruptions. We also have PEPFAR, which was proposed in 2003 by Bush, pledged and spent 15 million, then another 48 million over five years. 
But please note that the Global Fund and PEPFAR are subject to approval by Congress, so there is a lot of politicking. And of course, this is going to lead us back to women and girls. Politics and financing. The U.S. is, of course, a powerful voice in foreign assistance and a major provider of development assistance. But there are some very troublesome underlying dynamics in PEPFAR around women and girls that have persisted from the beginning. Amendments made to PEPFAR upon authorization included the now defunct gag rule prohibiting foreign assistance to groups that even counseled on abortion. But we still have the prostitution pledge requiring any NGO receiving government funding for HIV in the U.S. or developing countries to sign a document that they oppose prostitution. Unclear what this means, there's lots of complexity and lots of groups turn away sex workers who are one of the most HIV vulnerable populations. Um, Another huge underlying dynamic here is that PEPFAR funds very little sexual and reproductive health care. PEPFAR does not fund contraception. Um, think about that. And there's been very strong dynamics around abstinence and prevention and female control prevention methods in PEPFAR from the beginning. So this part is very critical. When you hear about siloed care for women and girls globally in HIV, what this means is that the treatment systems funded in response to the epidemic are not integrated with sexual and reproductive health care, which is, of course, where women and girls often go for health care. This underlying dynamic of ignoring how HIV manifests in women and girls and where they go for care has persisted since the beginning of the epidemic and is now reinforced by funding streams. So just like we had women dying of cervical cancer and HIV in 1990 in the U.S., we have soaring rates of HIV-positive women dying of cervical cancer in parts of southern Africa. Women with HIV are thought to be three to five times more likely to develop cancerous cervical lesions, but they are not getting care for this HIV manifestation in the same places they get their treatment. One last note, neither PEPFAR or Global Fund or any of these kind of big mechanisms fund human rights advocacy. What are the consequences of all of this for women and girls? How does this play out? Let's also talk about some of the strategies being used to change some of this context. I don't have time to cover all the regions or countries, so I'm going to talk about the U.S., Southern Africa, and a bit about East Africa. In terms of women, globally, 50% of women living with, 50% uh, of people living with HIV are women, with AIDS, that is, are women. Globally, young women make up 60% of all young people living with HIV. In Sub-Saharan Africa, which has borne the brunt of the epidemic, in 2010, women comprised 59% of adults living with HIV. Girls and young women comprised 78% of Sub-Saharan Africa's 15 to 24 year olds infected with HIV. So what are some of the human rights violations that are exacerbated for HIV positive women and girls and what are the strategies to combat them? First of all, lack of treatment ac access. In 2002, the South Africa Treatment Action Campaign sued the government to provide drugs that would prevent the transmission of HIV from mother to child. I want to show this clip because it shows some of the kind of underlying legal issues. My daughter died of AIDS at the age of nine months. There was no HIV mother to child transmission prevention program. I knew nothing about using antiretrovirals to prevent passing on the virus to my daughter. Research showed that a single dose of the antiretroviral nevarapin could reduce the incidence of mother-to-child transmission of HIV by 50%. This simple low-cost regimen reinforced the argument for a mother-to-child transmission prevention program. With over 60,000 HIV-positive infants born each year, the need was urgent. The Treatment Action Campaign has launched an application today in the Pretoria High Court for the government to implement mother-to-child transmission uh, programs. I'm also here uh, supporting um, 
this uh, court case against uh, our government because I think it is necessary for the, for the government to implement the MTCT to all the MOUs in South Africa, not only in Cape Town. I I'm supporting this because I also lost a child to MTCT. If there was MTCT PP, I think my child would have been alive today. The TAC took the government to the Constitutional Court, arguing that the Constitution guaranteed the right to life, dignity and equality as well as the right to health care and that this required government to implement a prevention of mother to child transmission program the court ruled in favor of the tac require the government to devise and implement within its available resources a comprehensive and coordinated program to realize progressively the rights of pregnant women and their newborn children to have access to health services to combat mother-to-child transmission of HIV. The steps that have to be taken to comply with the order that we make should be taken without delay. And I want to reiterate that the, the TAC is willing to work with government at every level to try and make this program a success. With this victory, the TAC redoubled its treatment literacy work. With the support of the Treatment Action Group from New York, treatment literacy workshops were held countrywide. These workshops laid the foundation of a treatment literate cadre, which understands the science and politics of HIV and AIDS. And you see here, all those proteins, all those parts of the virus are going to the outside of the cell and they're starting to bulge out here and then it gives off a daughter virus so the in 2002 the TAC pulled together all significant role players including churches trade unions government officials healthcare workers and others in a national treatment congress which expressed our commitment to creating a broad alliance in support of treatment okay now, that was a victory around stopping, preventing vertical transmission, but please note that most women still couldn't get treatment themselves, for themselves, for many years. Um, I want to go back to, I'm kind of now outlining some of the issues that particularly affect women and girls in the global epidemic that are the reasons for these numbers that we hear, and I think are often overlooked as parts of the HIV epidemic. So another one is that women cannot inherit and own property in many places. And obviously economic security plays a big role in women and girls' vulnerability to HIV AIDS. Um, in many places under customary law, women cannot inherit land, succeed to chieftainship, they have no right to property at divorce, some places inherited by their brothers-in-law. Um, this obviously is exposing women and girls to HIV risk, but also if they're HIV positive, often the stigma and, and discrimination is completely heightened. There is a rich set of cases on inheritance and land, which obviously have strong repercussions for HIV positive women. There, we're actually funding a lot of related advocacy and litigation. Advocates are creative and use constitutional law, regional human rights provisions, anything they can um, to challenge these provisions. And I know Aziza, who's with us, knows a lot about this. Um, there are a spectrum of sexuality, reproductive health, and rights abuses that HIV positive, that HIV affected women and girls face. Co coerced abortion, sterilization, lack of information of any kind about what's happening to them, no access to reproductive and sexual health services. Um, women fr from around the world routinely report pressure to abort. Other women have been forced to sign documents saying they'll never have children before they're allowed to have meds. We had this happening in Mississippi, um, in the U.S., and we had to, uh, advocates had to take that on. Um, in many places, women have to prove they're HIV negative to get married. Um, there is forced sterilization documented in Chile, Namibia, South Africa, the U.S., Uzbekistan, Swaziland, no informed consent. Many women are left by their husbands once they realize they've been sterilized. There's lots of requirements that women show proof of sterilization pre-employment. There is some very exciting litigation in Namibia 
um, right now, uh, which I know also Aziza has been involved in uh, with the South African Litigation Center and Namibia's Legal Assistance Center. Um, they've claimed forced sterilization is a violation of the right to privacy, life, and freedom from cruel and inhumane treatment. But what I'm going to show you is a clip of these kind of impromptu demonstrations that have happened uh, around the litigation. Uh, the government has, of course, tried to evade these charges, but lots of women, by seeing clips of what was happening or hearing about the lawsuit, realized that they had been sterilized and just started to show up uh, in front of the clinic. <laughs> The grandmothers of Africa at the front lines of the AIDS pandemic. Um, so just again, uh, you know, this is actually amazing that this is kind of spontaneous activism is happening and we're seeing more and more of it. Um, another factor around HIV is, of course, maternal mortality. As most of you probably know, a woman dies from complications from childbirth every minute, the vast majority in developing countries. Uh, but a woman in sub-Saharan Africa has a one in four chance of dying in childbirth. childbirth. And according to UNICEF, in the developing world, it's one in 4,000. This is a huge problem, but it's exacerbated when the women are HIV positive. There's lots of refusals to deliver babies or work on positive women. There's a case just filed in Uganda, which is very exciting, argue, arguing the failure to address maternal mortality, women bleeding to death due to lack of staff or equipment, violates the Constitution. And I think the groups are actually coming together to really look at the HIV impacts of this. Another factor is, of course, the huge, vast human rights violation of sex workers. Many girls and young women are sex workers. We have little data on what's happening. Over 100 countries criminalize some aspect of se sex work, all states but Nevada. There's all kinds of laws that actually get in the way of doing effective HIV work with sex workers. Um, there's a lot of current advocacy going on to actually get resources where they're needed despite that prostitution pledge requirement. Um, I just want to talk for a second about a case that we were involved in in New Orleans. There's a small group called Women with a Vision there who works with, uh, women, who post Katrina was working with women who, girls and women who were uh, working as sex workers and they were trying to do HIV outreach and they started to see that many of these girls and women were being picked up um, for having too many co too many condoms, for just being perceived to be sex workers, and were being actually prosecuted as sex offenders. Um, and it turned out the sex offender registry was more than 50% African American women. And if you were convicted under the sex offender uh, statute, which was this old statute, you actually had your license stamped sex offender and you couldn't enroll your kids in school anywhere near. So there were all these ramifications and um, we were able to, you know, support the Center for Constitutional Rights and the clinic at Loyola to actually get that provision changed. But just an example of how these crazy laws get used, and it turns out that women often bear the brunt of those laws. Um, 
So just sexual violence and HIV, which I talked about. Um, globally, there's not enough domestic violence protections. There's no marital rape protections in many places. Um, there's just not enough work between the links. We need a much greater commitment to address this set of issues. And to me, it really is shocking in 2012 to hear this is all understudied. We don't understand which role plays what. Um, it's just very, very heartbreaking. Um, women also, of course, bear the burden of caring for AIDS. In East and South Africa, it's estimated that 40 to 60 percent of care is for young people is provided by grandmothers. There's lots and lots of activism going on around this. There's something called the Home Based Care Alliance, which is actually, you know, trying to achieve some rights and some ways to get resources for this type of care. This is the last clip I'm going to show that's related to some of their efforts. Are no longer content to eke out a survival for themselves and their orphan grandchildren. They came together here and they sent out a clarion call to the world for urgent action and concrete support in the form of laws that must be passed to secure their rights, uh, to protect them from the violence that they are all enduring, and to very importantly provide and secure the economic independence and the social security that they and their families and communities require in order to thrive, not simply survive. Okay, I'm going to move into um, the kind of ways we can increase the advocacy impact and talk about, you know, kind of a little bit more of what's going on and what we need. I'm in a position of great privilege. Martha's right. I work in a beautiful building. Um, I behave myself in the beautiful building. Um, I... Uh, Obviously, we're able to support a lot of advocacy at the Ford Foundation, which is just amazing to be able to actually fund the people doing the work. Um, what we need is a lot more sexuality education that's complex, that isn't just physical, is that deals with the dynamics that go on. We need to focus much more on youths and aim interventions at vulnerable girls. We need way many more programs working with boys and men around violence and sexuality in the U.S. and otherwise. We need much better legal protections around violence. We need more access to lawyers. And, you know, lawyers who work on HIV AIDS rarely work on women and girls. They work on other issues. And often it's been true that the people who work on women's rights and sexual and reproductive health rights aren't seeing these issues that I outlined as necessarily HIV related. The UN needs to do more than just throw around all this data. I mean, I shared a lot of these data with you, but I'm tired of the data. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about how many international treaties support the rights of women and girls. These commitments need to be made meaningful at the country level, and we need much further breakdown of what's going on. Countries need to be held accountable. Everybody needs to be held accountable, whether it's the MDGs, ICPD, the National AIDS Strategies. There really are no accountability mechanisms in any of these global treaties. We are making process, pro progress, though. Um, uh, launched in 2010, there was a global commission on HIV in the law, which really looks at the relationship between human rights and legal responses. Um, there, this is a report that can be used by advocates, and it actually does talk about violence and HIV. Um, we really need to deconstruct these silos that I described. Um, we need to really stop with the groups that work in international spheres who write long reports on what's happening in Africa and Asia, um, but have too few links to the ground. Um, when I say we need accountability, I think we need it in many different directions. And the ground groups need much more support. I mean, there are these amazing groups all over the world doing this work. They know how to end what I've described, but they don't have the support they don't know how to apply to places like the Ford Foundation. They don't know how to write the proposals in the slick ways that some of these big international NGOs do. Um, and actually directly affected women and girls need to be trained in substantive ways. That's not just leaders. That's not just public speaking. That is what are, how do these, po what, what is causing what you're experiencing and how can we fix it? Um, I want to close with some lessons from my career. Um, the things I learned representing clients in the early years actually shaped my approach to everything. 
It's how I learned how disconnected some of the impact organizations are from their constituency bases. It's how I learned how much potential there is in leadership from the directly affected folks. So many times people said in this work I did with Martha and other, how did you figure out this was a problem? I said, very simply, you just see clients in the, in the form of a woman and a, a girl with HIV. You can pretty much trace all these policy uh, sources that are causing the problems that you see. Um, we just have to think more in that way. Um, I learned also that policy is often driven by groups with the most relative power even among powerless groups. So that is to say that really nobody cared that white gay men were dying or gay men were dying. So people responded and forced the government to care. But still, in the spectrum of affected populations, as I've said, other folks have did not get the same response. It's all very complicated, um, but it's not. It's everything that we know. So there's relative powerlessness among oppressed groups. Um, and I think that that, that is often under-interrogated. Um, I think that the really hopeful thing is remaining true to what I saw has shaped my work at Ford. And actually, what I always say to the leadership at Ford, when we actually are able to resource folks and policies change and funding streams change and things like the law in Louisiana get changed or Mississippi stops making the women sign papers, if you target resources and you actually are strategic, things will change. Um, so I am ultimately very optimistic in what can be done. It just has to be pushed. So I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to reflect on all of this and take, I guess, questions now, right? I mean, I totally agree. I think it's all related, and I think, you know, the reason that we see these numbers of women and girls have to do with all these underlying, this, this kind of underlying, I don't know, desire to control women and girls or some other thing, and HIV just makes it way worse because of the stigma and discrimination. But I think, um, I think uh, there, there's just a really kind of ugly uh, this thing that goes on around women and girls controlling their their sexuality. Why I don't I I wouldn't begin to guess. <laughs> There's, yeah, it's very, very low. I think it's the, it's virtually, um, virtually not happening at this point. I mean, that has been the, the, there has been much more success in the U.S. And, you know, I think one of the things that is true is that, um, it's absolutely sick that the numbers are so bad anywhere. So. I mean, that's, uh, I think that the whole is, the whole issue of healthcare delivery is very complicated and, um, some of it goes to what I was saying about the siloed care. 
So we may be pouring money into all this treatment delivery, but it's not integrated where women have babies, right? Um, so this kind of uh, separation of these issues and lack of integration plays out there, I think. Um, in the U.S., uh, you know, of course, everybody's very happy that we've completely um, stemmed mother-to-child transmission, but that has been the kind of favorite thing of the government to work on uh, in the U.S., much more so than the kind of thorny prevention issues, sexuality education, that kind of thing. So um, it's been very well-funded in the U.S., um, and in some cases, we also needed much more funding for kind of prevention, women and girls in care. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it's in philanthropy right now, it's kind of controversial funding grassroots versus funding, um, you know, so, so uh, you know, individual program officers at a foundation feel differently about this issue. I obviously think um, that you have to fund, you know, folks at the ground, then you have to fund folks at the ground who are working on survival issues. That's what you're, that's what you're saying. And, you know, I think we try to do that in various ways. So we're funding a lot of work around kind of getting, I only talked about it for a second, but getting people to be paid for the care they provide. Um, we try to get at that a lot of different ways. Um, because it's it's absolutely essential. Um, but I have to say that you know the thing about foundations is that they're they're controlled by boards and they change, right? So it may have been 20 years ago all the foundations funded legal services and now they don't. It may have been you know so so you have to try to when you're in philanthropy impact the trends best as possible. But they're often set at a much higher level than what. I'm at, for example, and you just try to affect them. So I can't really answer what everybody else is doing. So a, a couple unfortunate fractures, I think, have happened in uh, global AIDS advocacy about treatment and prevention. And of course, the, uh, women's issues have been, I mean, advocates for women's issues have also been fractured in this respect. Um, and many times there were concerns about the focus on treatment as if treatment wasn't reaching women. In fact, that at present, disproportionately reaching women in terms of the treatment access of men, uh, who often access treatment less frequently at a later stage of disease. And so I think one of the things that activists are struggling for is how to get groups that have had this history of some separation over treatment and prevention to respond to the new treatment as prevention uh, evidence to integrate the programming and the advocacy in a way that's synergistic instead of sometimes competitive and, and antagonistic. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts about the future direction of these efforts to, in a sense, develop a new united front. You know, I think... I think that, you know, there's lots of folks that, that uh, of course, this is huge news, right? If you start treatment at a much earlier point, you can stem transmission by 97% or 96%, whatever the study said. Um, but some people are reacting to that saying, great, we just have to treat everybody and we don't have to be bothered with all this structural inequality. We don't have to deal with sexual violence and domestic violence. We'll just, you know, treat people. And, of course, 
it's very complicated and, and all of the things I described about sexuality and reproductive health, um, it's also hugely complicated in many, many places in the world for men who have sex with men. And so, so I think that we can't lose sight of the fact that we have a huge opportunity here to like really, really turn the tide on this epidemic, but um, it's also very much, uh, you know, we can't abandon all this other work that needs to happen around structural inequality because it's pie in the sky to think that everybody's going to get treatment um, given the global climate, economic climate, et cetera. But I think uh, people have to really talk much more about all of this and actually bring to light some of these dynamics because a lot of times people say, well, the women and girls stuff, that's not HIV, that's women's rights problems. Um, but they're all integrated and similarly on many of the sex worker and MSM issues. Yeah, I mean, we, I think we really, really try to do that, both so when we get uh, proposals from international groups who throw around 20 treaties, we say, okay, so who are you working with in the countries most impacted, and where are the directly impacted people? So you can do it in that way, but also I think the far heavier lift, which is why there's not so much of it, is working with the groups like International Community of Women Living with HIV. There's tons of groups all around the world who are doing the work. They're the ones who first identified the sterilization problem. But you, you know, you can work with groups and you can help them and you can. But it's it's just really work intensive and um, there is very little funding for it. I mean, what we try to do actually is in places where maybe so the law has been changed in a good way. This comes up in South Africa. It comes up in Alabama, Mississippi, and yet people continue to discriminate, won't let HIV-positive people into nursing homes, or there's millions of examples. I think we try to strengthen the advocacy so that there's there's lawyers or somebody available to respond because often with the kind of discrimination that goes on in HIV, a few lawyers, a few threats, you can actually, uh, in some places, in some instances though, when you're talking about say maternal mortality or rollout of treatment and violations, um, there needs to be much, sometimes going back to court, sometimes just advocacy campaigns, but that part is as big as changing the policy. Um, but if there's nobody available to fight uh, is when it kind of goes on and on, I think. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to say that if that's what it sounded like. I guess what I get tired of is the spinning of the data about how many women and girls are affected, and then at the same time, we still haven't interrogated the basic links between sexual violence and paths to HIV infection. So um, without research, we don't aren't able to establish anything. Oh, wow. I 
I've watched lots of ten years. I'm sure. And uh, I felt especially privileged because, because of my color, it was very difficult to find employment, even with two college degrees. And so I ended up with two jobs, partly, as my husband of 56 years would attest. I worked for Planned Parenthood, uh -huh. PPFA, and at the same time I worked in the United Nations Department of Public Information. And I began to see small scale. Mm -hmm. The great dynamics of our time, if not all time, population on the one hand, and racism on the other, or colonialism, whichever you call it. I've been impressed that there was such a disproportion of women involved in the founding of the United Nations, or even the successive decades. And a few years ago, which you would be aware, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1325, which has as its goal that women should be at all policy-making levels in proportion to our numbers in we the peoples of the total world population. It was my privilege to be at the United Nations of few days ago and see that 4,000 women of color came to the meeting of CEDAW, we call it for short, which stands for Commission on the Status of Women. And yet, I question whether or not there is sufficient communication <coughs> between those who still control, rightly or wrongly, the bulk of resources of this rich climate of ours, and those who make everyday policy. No doubt you're aware that I assume most of us as readers and listeners of a digital age are aware that uh, recently we've come to acknowledge that um, the problems of the world are really so interwoven, so intertwined, that old approaches are not going to suffice. And as we have moved from UNIFEM, which was the United Nations Fund for Women in Development, and of course it was focused on the undeveloped nations, as if this were separate from the highly developed nations. This has changed altogether. There is no longer UNIFEM. It is now United Nations UN Women. I wonder what hope do you see in Resolution 1325 and in the spirit of a whole division that is for women for the future of our international peace and security is the charter. You know, I, I really appreciate uh, all you've done, and actually I really appreciate your comments, because I, I think that the um, without, it's kind of like the research comment. I was kind of, I, at Ford, I'm rarely able to kind of critically analyze, so I took my opportunity here to criticize certain things. I think the UN and UN women and all of the work to establish the basic human rights of women have been to has been totally critical. And I think the potential for UN women is huge. But I think this issue of um, kind of uh, folks on the ground who have the kind of, you know, solutions and potential strategies that are very different maybe than the ones that have been used all these years. Um, having them have access at the UN level, having them impact uh, the poli how things are done at the UN level is, is extremely important as opposed to kind of the model of the groups in the uh, you know, these groups go in and form the rest of the world. I think it has to be the other way. Because um, I, I feel like I see all of those incredibly important historical 
um, the list of, of think, protections that, that exist at the UN level for women that have been hard fought. And they are used in cases like the sterilization case, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but I feel like there could be so much more, uh, you know, kind of use of things and so much more of a richer dialogue at the UN level if we had many, many more people who are, you know, kind of directly affected by what we're talking about, i.e. women who know what maternal mortality is about, all of that. Um, so I think there's huge potential, but I think that um, we need to figure out how to lift up those new strategies and activists uh, to this kind of whole new, a whole new way. Um, because the mechanisms just don't have the kind of... Uh, accountability that we need. So we need more, if that's helpful. So, thank you. Ms. Govern, on behalf of Northeastern School of Law, also is Kemet Chapter here and the Valerie Gordon lecture hosted by Fergie every year. We would like to thank you. Oh, thank you so much. For coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> With that said, before I introduce the family members, I would like to emphasize one aspect of what Ms. Govern has spoken about and that's advocacy. Um, this was very important, as we heard from Professor Parmet um, to Valerie Gordon. It's very important to the members of the Kemet chapter, and it's also in, uh, very important to our organization, the Black Law Students Association. As of this week, on Monday, officially our advocacy uh, campaign is surrounded around Trayvon Martin, so I would be remiss if I did not bring that to your attention. Um, I would like to challenge all of the students in this room to advocate for all things that are wrong with our society, including that affecting women, people of color, and all those underrepresented and oppressed in our world, because your voices, like we heard from Ms. Govern, can make a difference one day. So with that said, it's the 19th year of the Valerie Gordon Lecture, and every year we have her family members come to visit us. So I would like to bring up um, Mr. and Mrs. Pulley, well, Mr. Pulley can stay there, um, Mr. Jermaine Jones, who is from Georgia, Ms. Catherine Jones from Mississippi, Ms. Dolores Johnson from Mississippi, and Mr. and Mrs. Lamar here from Georgia. Um, thank you. <laughs> I invite you guys to come and give the closing remarks to the lecture as always. <laughs> last year, uh, given the closing remarks from the family, um, I was doing advocacy <laughs> at that time. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for, for my clients at the uh, Georgia Capitol Defender, we are, speaking on behalf of our family, we are so appreciative of the law school, the Black Law Students Association, and everybody involved with 19 years. 19 years, and I say my son because my son is 18 years old. He'll turn 19. And as you know, um, Valerie passed shortly after uh, having our son, Faluke. Uh, the great thing about coming back and having been here at Northeastern is the sense of community. Uh, sitting in the audience is um, Chris Alibrandi, uh, class of 95. Um, and we had the unfortunate occasion to attend uh, the funeral of Andrea Taylor, who was a class of 95. But what a lot of people don't know is that Valerie was Andrea Taylor's teaching assistant. She was her TA. And of course, I, I was uh, Chris's TA, 
But, but the thing is, is that it comes full circle. And when I talk about the community, is that when 19 years ago, in 93, when Valerie passed, Andrea and Chris were there to support me. And then a few weeks ago, when Andrea passed, and Vince, Vince and her husband, class of 95, we were there uh, to lend our support to him. And that is the wonderful thing about this place in terms of many folks, you know, I talk to folks about their law schools all the time. Man, I ain't going back there, I ain't getting no money, I don't care nothing about these folks. They made my life hell while I was there. Um, our community at Northeastern is very, very special. And that's why it is always great for us to come back. And on behalf of our family, we thank you. We thank you so very much. Uh, just in case you guys aren't doing anything this afternoon, we will be having a cookie and tea reception in the sunroom uh, with the family. If you would like to speak to them and hang out with them, um, Mr. Pulley has a lot of stories and so does Mrs. Pulley. So <laughs> I thank you all for attending this year's lecture and thank you, Ms. McGovern, Ms. McGovern, for giving the lecture this year. Thank you. So the, the, the sunroom the sunroom is over in the library for people that don't know. So thank you.